Good afternoon, good evening, uh, good morning, everyone around the planet again. Thanks for joining us again. Jim and I uh, are here to uh, just uh, address some of the questions that came up through yesterday's uh, webinar on stockpiling. Um, so Jim and I put our heads together and we thought, let's just run another little session and get those uh, Q&As out to you on a video. Um, so just to recap, I'm, I'm just going to quickly share my screen and we'll get straight into some of those questions. As everyone knows, yesterday's uh, webinar was about extending summer's bounty. And uh, Jim and I put our heads together and we thought, let's, uh, let's actually uh, split this into two sessions. So yesterday was about stockpiling um, based on your location and what opportunities are available to you. And we're going to be running part two on the 30th of September, uh, Mountain Time in the States and 1st of October, 11 a.m. Uh, back here in Australia. Uh, but uh, to get through to the, the questions that we really wanted to, to run through, um, Jim and I uh, will run through those questions that sort of came on the back of the stockpiling um, webinar we ran yesterday. Some are related to stockpiling, some are not, but that's okay. We'll just, we'll just rip into them. Um, so what we might do is Jim, we'll, uh, we'll just share our faces again. And, um, and then we'll get into these questions. Okay, the, the question one was uh, from Paul, um, who I believe is on uh, Prince, Edward, Prince Edward Island, uh, PEI in, uh, in Canada, up in the Atlantic Canada, and was just wondering about, you know, stockpiling and up there and, and what, what's available to them. Um, they get a lot of snow up there, as you know. Um, it's just a bit of context setting for you, Jim. Right, so, uh, in the Kick the Hay Habit book, I talk about three areas where winter grazing probably really isn't feasible. And the, uh, Mar the Great Lakes region of the US and uh, Eastern Canada and the Maritime provinces in Canada are some of those really challenging areas just due to depth of snow. Um, if, you, if you routinely have four foot, five foot, six foot of snow hanging around, you're not going to do very much winter grazing. So the brief, the quick answer to Paul is it would be very challenging. You might have opportunities for extending, you know, using uh, some stockpiled feed to maybe extend your grazing season by a few weeks on the front side of winter and maybe get out a little early in the spring. But uh, I'm sorry to say grazing a big part of the winter in the maritime provinces of Canada could be quite, quite challenging. So qu quite a tough deal there, but I guess, you know, it's still possible to potentially extend a couple of weeks in and come out early. Yep. So, you know, I guess management comes into play regardless of the, the context. So thanks for that. Um, no, next one is from, uh, from Kyle, uh, located uh, north central Texas near the Red River, beautiful part of the world. I've been there a bunch of times myself. Um, Kyle's saying, my grass is primarily Bermuda, Bermuda grass. Uh, what advice would you have to extend the grazing season into the fall and winter? I know on the webinar, we did talk a little bit about Bermuda grass and probably um, some of your answers were quite contextually based around that area, but uh, it'd be good just to tick that one off for Kyle, Jim. Okay, so when we're stockpiling something like Bermuda grass, we're usually only looking at 40 to 50 day stockpiling period. Now, uh, increasingly, especially in the regenerative ranching community, rather than relying on heavy doses of nitrogen fertilized on Bermuda grass, which has kind of been the history in uh, Texas and most of the southern U.S., more and more are introducing uh, the heat tolerant white clover varieties uh, to supply the nitrogen or growing uh, hairy veg, crimson clover, arrowleaf clover, different winter annual forages. So to make the value of an acre of Bermuda grass greater for fall and winter grazing, uh, interseeding those legumes uh, would be a big step towards improving the quality and nutritional value of stockpiled Bermuda grass in um, Kyle's region there. Great, thanks so much, Jim. Uh, thanks for the question, Kyle. Um, keep them coming next time around too. Uh, next one's coming in, uh, a little, I guess, a little bit closer to home for you from uh, Southwest Idaho. Charles has shot in a question about what is a good mix for Southwest Idaho if starting with new pastures and wanting toward wanting to work toward a year-round grazing as soon as possible? Okay, um, we always have to have the context. 
in southwest Idaho, we are going to have some irrigated land and we're going to have some native land. Um, if, uh, he, if he's asking about irrigated pasture, uh, what we like as our base grass mix on irrigated pasture in Idaho, uh, Eastern Oregon, Washington, Nevada, Utah, Mo Montana, Wyoming, the, this whole intermountain irrigated region, all right? Um, we like to have tall fescue in there, but also meadow fescue. And on the tall fescue from a palatability standpoint, yes, the soft leaf fescues are more desirable, but for something that will stand up through the snow, tall fescue uh, is actually preferable. We like to put both of them into the mixture, along with meadow brome grass, which as I mentioned last night, is kind of second to the fescues in terms of maintaining um, good uh, nutritional value into the winter. Uh, we like orchard grass in that mix because we're also going to be utilizing it through the uh, summer months some. So that those would be our grass components, uh, tall fescue, meadow fescue, uh, meadow brome grass, and orchard grass. And then for legumes in there, we like the um, alcite clover and bird's foot tree fall because of the high stem digestibility. Uh, we like uh, red clover for the yield contribution that it makes uh, both in the active growing season and it, it's still a much better standing feed in the winter than what uh, alfalfa might be. So those four grasses, those three legumes, that makes a very good irrigated mixture. If you are trying to establish some uh, rangeland back again for winter use, uh, just quite frankly, because of the cost of seed, the native grasses are very expensive. So we do tend to lean towards using the introduced uh, uh, grasses for seeded winter range. And that would include Russian wild rye, intermediate wheat grass. Uh, depending on location, we might be also including some slender or pubescent wheat grasses but the uh, Russian wild rye and intermediate wheat grass are kind of the foundational species that work across a lot of environments that we would then tweak in with some additional uh, species depending on the specific location. Thanks, thanks Jim. Um, that was a very comprehensive answer. Um, I guess the, the, the trick to this um, is just getting as much context as possible. So. Um, we're probably going to be opening up uh, more of a, a Q&A sort of line with Maya Grazing here and, and uh, those that uh, work with us around the planet um, over the next few months. So we'll, we'll uh, to, to build uh, the relevance uh, of our answers, etc. it'd be great to just get a little bit more context. So we'll put some work into that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, when you send a question in, if you can put your location and whether it's dry land or irrigated, um, that becomes, those are two very important considerations in my answering these kind of questions. Yeah, exactly. Thanks, Jim. Um, next one's from Joe. Um, I think I may have met Joe. Thanks for sending this in. Um, Joe's uh, got a question. So how does one get a legume established in a predominantly brome cool season pasture? Okay, uh, smooth brome grass is a sod forming grass it is very competitive, it is tough. Um, so if, if you can obviously run a disc out there and knock it back some, um, but we know tillage is not beneficial for soil health. And also if you happen to get a rain right after that disking, because smooth brown grass has all these little rhizomes in the ground, you will actually just make it thicker and more competitive. You could, of course, spray it with um, Roundup or a Gramoxone to either kill it or thin it out. But again, as we think about regenerative ranching and soil health and all the other ramifications of using those pharmaceuticals, we prefer not to do that. So that leaves us with the, the grazing approach of doing it. There's, when we look at cool season grasses and think about their susceptibility to being weakened by grazing, the month prior to the end of the growing season. We, where we're located, we generally talk about October. So if you 
go to a pasture and do everything that we tell you not to do in grazing management during the active growing season, that's what you wanna to do to smooth grown grass as it's heading into winter. We wanna graze it too short, we wanna come back to it too soon and try to weaken that. Uh, we can either broadcast that seed or use a no-till drill to put that um, seed in the ground in late winter, or early spring. And we want to keep cattle on those pastures just grazing it severely down until the legume seedlings start to emerge. And when the legume seedlings are emerging, then we will take the cattle off of it, typically for uh, about six weeks. And then we would uh, try to lightly graze it, basically to top out the grasses if we could. Uh, by that time, they're probably grazing some of the legumes also. The key point is on that six weeks after seedling emergence grazing, we want that to be a gentle grazing, not a severe grazing. Thanks, Jim. Um, the next one, I'm not sure whether uh, Taryn here is trying to um, see whether I can pronounce uh, really long words on, on, uh, on a live broadcast or not, but he's, uh, he's going to be pushing my uh, ability. So help us out, Jim. Uh, the question is, uh, Jim, have you ever had issues with uh, alcite coosing photo hyposensitization in your animals with lighter pigments. Um, you, you, or said that you, very, you said that very nicely. That was just exactly what the word is. Well, that's great. Well, that's good to know, but I'm not going to say it again. So I'm going okay. out with 100% strike rate. All right. So what photo hypersensitization is, um, there are sometimes present in alcite clover and some other forages and it's debatable whether that um, chemical presence is from the plant itself or from a microbial organism uh, growing on the leaf. Uh, but it causes the skin on the face of light pigmented animals to, to blister and they actually to the point where it can start sloughing off and it's a bloody mess and um, generally you just terminate that animal when it gets that bad. Okay. Um, I have very, very rarely uh, ever seen cases of photosensitization. It has generally happened on white-faced sheep um, when I've experienced it, but also on Hereford cattle. Um, in the Midwest, when we lived in Missouri, I considered alcite clover a very wimpy, weak plant, and I had no desire to have it in a pasture. In that humid environment, it did show a lot of leaf diseases. And as I said, um, it's still argued whether it's the microorganisms causing the photosensitization or the alcite clover itself. Uh, in the irrigated West, alcite clover is a much more robust plant, very uh, productive. And in our irrigated pastures, and we have tons of alcite clover, I do not see the same leaf diseases here that we saw in the Midwest. And in the 16 years I've been out here, um, I've not seen an actual case of photosensitization here. Um, our cowgirl on the ranch, she is concerned with her horses, some of which, which have white blazed faces with uh, the alcite clover in the horse pastures whether she's concerned because she has read about it or whether she has actually ever seen it um, is, again, another question. It's one of those okay. things you hear a lot about but uh, rarely see. Okay, thanks, Jim. And thanks for the, the question, Taryn. Uh, good to see uh, some questions coming in from the USDA as well. That's great. Um, next one's from uh, Garrett. Um, uh, in Central Texas. Jim, I have some pasture with Tipton 85 in Central Texas. What would be a good legume mix to use in our environment? Our soil type is predominantly clay, sandy clay loam. Okay, this is where the heat tolerant white clovers do well and specific varieties that we generally, you know, would be recommending and using are Durana and Patriot. And in that uh, part of Texas on those kind of soils, for winter annual legumes, and um, remember we're talking about this Bermuda grass in the context of winter grazing. So um, the 
Common or Hairy Vetch, uh, Crimson Clover, Arrowleaf Clover, Ball Clover, any of those would work with uh, Bermuda grass in a winter grazing scenario. Fantastic. Thanks, Jim. And thanks, Garrett, for sending that one through. Uh, next one's from Allison. Um, Jim, how do we best tell if protein is needed by reading the cow as opposed to uh, forage testing? Or is forage testing the only way? Uh, forage testing is w when you're first learning how to winter graze and management, I do encourage people to do forage testing to see what you are uh, working with. When it comes to um, monitoring manure, what I am generally looking at is the length. So in the manure pile, there's going to be indigested, un, excuse me, undigested fiber fractions in there. Uh, the more undigested fiber there is, the taller the manure pile stacks up. So if manure piles are standing up thicker than, you know, four or five inches, if you actually have piles from cattle that are seven, eight or taller, there's probably a, a, a protein deficiency. So just how the pile stack is one. But if you get in there and start tearing it apart and look at uh, fiber fragments, if you have a healthy functioning room and proper um, nitrogen carbon ratio in there, you're not going to see very many fiber segments longer than about a quarter of an inch. When you start seeing um, fiber fragments, three eighths, half inch or longer, uh, that means the rumen is not functioning so well and probably needs a uh, protein boost. So I, I would say definitely, if you're seeing fiber fragments longer than a half inch, you better get protein into those animals fairly quickly. Great, thanks, Jim. Thanks, Allison. Um, John uh, sent a question in. I'm not exactly sure where he is, but um, uh, again, probably good to get a little bit more context, but that's all right. Um, how many days of rest do you suggest for tall, warm seasons in 35 to 40 inch rainfall? I guess this could be, you know, the, the context of location, but also the, you know, dividing things that we're looking at sort of native warm seasons or introduced subtropicals. Okay, the fact that uh, John said tall, warm seasons, I think he's probably referring to native tall grasses, uh, prairie grasses, because that's what I would expect to be seeing in a 35, 40 inch uh, precipitation zone. Mm -hmm. um, in, in the um, webinar last night, I said, when we we're talking about Bermuda grass, 40 to 50 days would be our max. When we're looking at things like big blue stem, Indian grass, uh, we might stretch that out to 65, 70 days. Okay, thanks, Jim, uh, and thanks, John. Next one uh, in from Ryan uh, from Southeast Ohio. Um, uh, I'll, I'll just read this out as, as best I can. I'm located in Southeast Ohio. Is it possible to start the grazing season with the properly with a properly stocked ranch for year-round grazing, and manage the grass so that you keep the seed heads off with the livestock, and therefore graze up the forage so that by winter you have stockpiled your entire ranch with good quality feed for dry cows in winter? Um, that's actually a fairly complicated question. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Um, yeah, it is much easier to manage feed supply with what we would term a variable stocking rate. <clears throat> so the timing of and emphasize effective stocking rate Stocking rate isn't only the absolute number of animals you have, it is what is their nutritional demand at a particular point in the season. So um, for example, a lactating cow, depending on her milking ability, it's going to be her at peak lactation, she'll be consuming anywhere from 30 to 80%, maybe even double what her requirement is when she's a dry pregnant cow at maintenance. So matching calving season so that that peak demand for forage consumption coincides with your peak forage supply is one of the key pieces of getting that uh, in balance. It is much easier to manage the year-round forage supply if you have more than just a cow-calf enterprise. Um, spring gray stockers are a very good tool 
or spring grazed call cows are a very good tool for um, managing forage supply. A lot of it depends on what species we're talking about, whether or not you use nitrogen fertilizer. If you're still using nitrogen fertilizer, you get a huge spike in growth in the spring that is very difficult to manage just with grazing. If you have eliminated nitrogen from your program and you're using grass legume mixtures, uh, that, yes, you have a spring peak in yield, but it doesn't come up as fast and it's not as high relative to the summer uh, slump period and it's easier to manage. I really do encourage people to add a, uh, a short grazing enterprise with additional animals in the spring so that you can ramp up the pressure. The way we ran our farm in Missouri, we um, on a year round basis, uh, figured that our resident cow-calf herd would need to eat about 60% of the forage that we produced in the year. The additional 40% was consumed by additional animals that we brought in onto the farm in the spring, uh, usually for about a 90 to 100 day period. And using a system like that, it is much, much easier to manage forage supply and quality than it is trying to accomplish it entirely with just one class of livestock and mechanical harvest being out of the picture for you. So to, to answer his question for what he is asking, I think it's a very challenging situation. And so I encourage him to consider a add-on spring uh, grazing enterprise to manage excess forage supply. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jim. I mean, a, lo a lot going on there. And I guess, you know, that only just exemplifies the, uh, the complexity of what we're trying to achieve, regardless of the context, you know, this this whole grazing game, it's an art and science. Um, so uh, there's a lot going on. And thanks for sending in that question, Ryan. Um, make sure that you stick around to future webinars and keep them keep them coming in. Um, next one, a uh, question from uh, JR or Junior. Um, apologies, I'm not sure which one you refer to yourself as, but uh, JR in East Texas. Uh, what's a good uh, winter forage uh, to plant for sheep in East Texas, Jim? Uh, first I'll say, hi JR, how you doing? Good to hear from you again. Um, as, as a winter annual forage in uh, Texas, East Texas, you know, any of the brassicas are good for sheep, annual ryegrass, Italian ryegrass, um, th those are good choices. They're high quality feed, very palatable to sheep, easy to establish. Fantastic. And, and I, I guess uh, we, we have it. It's JR. It's not Junior. So apologies, uh, yeah. JR. J I, I've been on JR's farm. And uh, so, yeah, very definitely JR. Fantastic. Well, hopefully one day I might gain an invite too and I'll be able to address you face to face as JR. So, um, next one with uh, an easy one for me, we've got Mark here. Um, uh, the question from Mark is, do the principles of uh, autumn growth for winter grazing directly convert to spring growth for summer grazing? We have long, hot summers, Mediterranean climate in southern Australia. Thanks, Mark. I think I know who you are. Are you going to answer that one? No, no. You're, uh, you're, oh, you're I've, I've got to do that? Well, you're, that's... you're doing all the answers. Um, uh, all right. Uh, yep, that's all right. Even for Australian questions. Absolutely. Okay. Um, do the principles of autumn growth for winter grazing directly convert to spring growth for summer grazing? Uh, no, not directly. And part of the reason for that is cool is the friend of forage quality. Hot is the enemy of forage quality. So stockpiling spring growth to get you through a hot summer dry period uh, is not exactly the same as uh, what we're talking about accumulating fall gr growth for winter grazing because the hot weather of the summer is going to cause the forage to lignify. And then also, if you have hot, dry winds blowing, that breaks leaves off of plants. It causes plant breakdown uh, actually much more quickly 
than what the winter cold winds do. So it's, it, it, it is not a direct conversion. And now, um, I don't know if this would have any application at all in Southern Australia in your situation, but um, here in the States, there are some people who will actually use swath grazing for summer stockpiling. They will have that spring growth. Uh, they will put it into a swath to preserve the quality of that feed. Um, the biggest problem that comes with that is those hot, dry winds might blow your windrows away. So whether or not you can use uh, late spring swathing to store feed for the summer really depends on um, what your wind situation is, I would say. There's a lot of hot air down here, Jim, so uh, you just never know. It's all about context, isn't it? It is. Um, thanks a lot, Mark, for sending that through. Next one, uh, another one from uh, East Coast of Australia, and I'll let you answer this as well, Jim, because uh, I'm, uh, I'm smart enough to not claim to be an expert in anything. So um, this one's from Normie. Um, I've gathered from reading Jim's book, Kicking the Hay Habit, and listening to the SGF grazing schools, the Stockman Grass Farmer grazing schools, that he's a big fan of sowing winter annuals to extend the growing season and support animal performance. But increasingly for us, the cost to benefit ratio of sowing winter active pastures is becoming less and less attractive. We're considering skipping the practice and just trying to stimulate the perennial pastures with fertilizers, granula and or other. I've observed the pasture on the edge of our sown paddocks growing green and lush with little inputs except from a little over sow or starter fertilizer. What are Jim's thoughts on fertilizing perennial pasture to kick start the spring growth and then also extending the quality into late autumn or fall, early winter? Now, I know you talked a little bit about fertilizer uh, yesterday in the webinar, etc. So it could be a bit of crossover, but um, yeah, just to answer Darren's uh, question there specifically, um, I'll over to you, Jim. Okay. Um, I want to first say something about that use of uh, winter annual pasture. You can spend a hundred bucks on seed, fertilizer, drilling, putting a winter annual pasture out there. With lax grazing management, you might only harvest 50 AUDs per acre out of there, making your cost $2 per AUD. With good, solid, controlled grazing management, that same field might produce 200 AUDs per acre, making your cost uh, only 50 cents per AUD. And so to, to me, yes, I am a fan of winter annual pastures, but I always emphasize that they need to be aggressively managed to capture that investment that you have made in them. So controlled grazing is every bit as important on annual pastures as it is for keeping your perennials healthy and productive. Now coming to this um, using fertilizer to stimulate the growth. Um, if, if we are talking about cool season perennials there, uh, nitrogen can be used to stimulate their growth uh, in the fall to give you more yield in the winter. If we are talking about predominantly warm season grasses, uh, there's very little value in applying nitrogen to those to stimulate the late season growth to try to enhance the quality of those. Great, thanks Jim and, and, and that point about aggressively managing those winter annuals. I mean just this week uh, uh, just down the road from where I live here, in, um, not, not far from southern Tablelands, New South Wales, uh, I, I saw on one side of the, the road some uh, fantastic aggressive management of uh, the winter annuals and, and, and oats uh, and then right across the across the road, uh, huge investment, very similar outlay, different property, um, and uh, being managed entirely differently. And I'd say that, you know, the, the, the return on, on investment there would be uh, fourfold of the first one I mentioned. It was um, uh, quite incredible to see, really, in plain sight of each other. Um, thanks for the question, Darren. Uh, appreciate you uh, sending that one through. Um, next one. Um, I think we may have addressed that yesterday. It's from Andy, um, uh, someone who didn't really start that rotational grazing until June 2020. I think we addressed that one yesterday. We did, yeah. Yeah. 
Um, and there was also another one here, Kat, you were talking about irrigation within Maya grazing, and I gave you a quick overview of, uh, of how we manage that um, in Maya grazing. So looking forward to um, connecting with you directly on that one. Um, now, there is uh, another one here from Paul, and we'll probably, this will be the second last one. I think we've grouped together a couple of other questions uh, that we did have um, in the basic sort of themes that we've covered off here, Jim. So uh, another one from uh, Australia in the dry tropics um, from Paul. I'm intensively cell grazing a small herd of Brahmin cattle in the dry tropics of Queensland, Australia. It is country with low fertility soil and predominantly black spear grass pasture. I normally have five months summer rain producing grass growth and then seven months dry with very little growth. My last three year running average yearly rainfall is 500 millimetres um, or rolling rainfall. At the last three years rolling rainfall, uh, summer rainfall is 350 millimetres. Would you please discuss the main principles that I should be applying to achieve the best practice grazing in this environment? Okay, I, I think in this environment, a couple of key things are um, ensuring through your grazing management, you're putting plant litter on the soil surface. Uh, that's going to uh, keep it cooler. It's going to seal, secure some of the water in there. Um, in the precipitation ranges that you're talking about, um, enhancing the water cycle so you make more effective use of that water is a very key component. Um, leaving adequate residual to ensure the opportunity for those plants to regrow when the wet season comes again is important. Uh, how do we accomplish this? Uh, short grazing periods, high impact, knock some of the plant material down um, to create that litter layer. We do a lot of that in the dormant season um, because the, the plants are easy, sometimes easier to break down at that point. But um, Increasing the litter layer to get a more functional water cycle is very important, leaving the residual, and that's going to help build, you know, carbon in the soil. And uh, as, as we increase the carbon content of the soil, we increase the water holding capacity. As we increase litter, we're keeping the temperature cooler so we don't have as much evaporative loss. That leaves more water in the soil available to support actual plant growth and function. Uh, so I, I think those would be the key points there. Great, thanks Jim and um, thanks, thanks Paul for sending that one through. Um, last one, in our environment um, it is advised to graze ryegrass at least, uh, sorry, at three leaf stage and graze all leaves off to four centimetres, the metric, so a couple of inches. How would you do it and what would you think of this? and how do you manage animals leaving clumps? So um, that's from William, uh, not necessarily a stockpiling question, but that's okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, in the early 1980s, when I was first introduced to um, controlled grazing, uh, three leaves on rye grass and grazing it down to less than two inches, um, I learned pretty quickly that what works in maritime New Zealand, Western Europe, Ireland, does not work in a continental climate. When we tried to manage pastures in those ways, um, maybe the first grazing cycle of the, uh, of the spring in April or May, we had nice recovery and, oh, this works. Uh, second grazing cycle, not so much. And pastures we grazed that way were basically shot for the season. So once again, context. Are we in a maritime climate? Are we in a continental climate? Are we in a Mediterranean climate? All of those things make a difference in how uh, the plants are going to respond. Because I am a fan of building litter on the soil surface and a fan of leaving residual to keep the soil cooler, um, I am not at all a fan of grazing everything at three leaf stage, you know, down to four centimeters. Um, there are maritime locations where that evidently works. Um, I do not live in a maritime location. We are all products of our own experience. Um, so I, I'm not going to guide anybody down that path. 
until I've lived in a maritime climate for 10 years and managed grass in that environment. Great. Thanks, Jim. Look, thanks so much for your time again today. I, I know that you need to uh, head off uh, on a bit of a drive and, and meet Galen up on a mountain pass somewhere and bask at the glory of uh, the mountains in Idaho. Um, so thanks so much for your time. Thanks on behalf of uh, everyone um, who attended the webinar and, and, and really appreciate everyone who sent in those questions. Um, the, the last question was uh, um, uh, that, that I'll, we, we actually answered yesterday and it was all around uh, when do you decide to de-stock some of your cattle or sheep or what have you to ensure that we've got enough of a stockpile. Now, uh, we, we talked about that yesterday. That'll really come into um, that next webinar that we're going to be running on the 30th of September, 7 p.m. Uh, Mountain Time in North America, 1st of October, 11 a.m. Eastern Standard Time here in Australia. Um, that'll be all about uh, tools and techniques um, that we'll be utilising to, to manage that winter grazing to extend it. Um, so until then, um, keep the questions coming. Make sure that we've got context, location where you are, whether we're dealing with um, uh, dryland pastures, native pastures, whether we're dealing with irrigation, etc. Um, keep it all coming in, everyone. And um, thanks so much for, for joining yesterday. And we look forward to uh, look forward to having you again, Jim. Jim, any parting words? Uh, no, just. Thank you for hosting this thing and you're welcome for my time. We'll talk no to problem. you in the next.